Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Dick. I am alcoholic. And I'm very, very grateful to be here. My home group is the Macklin Group, which is in Powder Springs, Georgia. And uh, a little too close. There you go. Uh, the Macklin Group, which is in Powder Springs, Georgia. And uh, we meet on Monday night, Thursday night, and uh, now Saturday night. I am a greeter in my home group. Uh, we moved out that way about, uh, well, I guess about four or five years ago. Um, we had to move from the high price spread to uh, live more modestly after I got some cancer. And uh, we found this group, and it was about 10, 15 people, and two or three of us were pretty enthusiastic, and the rest were just coming. Um, but uh, it was the best group we could find. There was an al group in the same uh, church, so Barbara joined that. I joined that group. We started having group conscious meetings, which they weren't having, and we started making sure that everybody who walked through the door um, uh, got a job in the home group. Um, I volunteered to head up the greeter committee, and people laughed because they all knew each other. Our last meeting, <laughs> our, our last meeting on Thursday, uh, we had 150 people, and. Uh, we only had one meeting to start with. Now we have a beginner's meeting on Thursday night for the people who are brand new. And we have 30 people in there every week because they were, it does two things. One, it keeps them out of the general meeting so we don't, they don't share how they're feeling. And, uh, <laughs> the second thing is it, it helps them to find out what a sponsor, what a home group, what the big book, all of these things are. And some of them may find out that they belong to another 12 step. Fellowship, but uh, it's great in the beginners' meeting. It's great out on the Thursday night. Uh, we had a deficit because some of the people didn't have sponsors that were taking them through the steps. So we just started two weeks ago a Saturday night meeting, which is our 12 and 12. It's not based just strictly on the 12 and 12. It's the big book, the 12 and 12, and any other literature. But we do the first step one week, the, the first tradition the next week, the second step, the second tradition, and uh, and it's full as well too. So. We're alive and well, and if you're anywhere near that, that's about 30 miles west of Atlanta. We just put Atlanta on the name badge because nobody knows where Lithia Springs is. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, my sobriety date, by the way, is June the 8th, 1977. Uh, and um, I want to thank um, uh, uh, Jimmy and Mary Beth. Uh, from the very beginning, this has run smoothly. They've uh, absolute service. They were very thoughtful and gracious for us. Uh, when we checked in, uh, because of my cancer, I have certain, I have to sleep sitting up in a sofa, and uh, I can't ever lie down. They replaced my esophagus, and so uh, uh, they took care of that. Uh, Jerry was uh, uh, absolutely great. He said, I'll be wearing, I thought he said, I'm wearing a Yankees cap. And we actually met in Maryland, but I didn't remember which one of the guys that I met Jerry was. And he said, I'm wearing a Yankees cap. So I was looking for a little guy. In my mind, it was a little guy with a Yankees cap. And he was actually wearing a Yankees jersey. It was like a walking billboard for the Yankees. <laughs> and when we finally got together, Jimmy had – I actually had his cell phone to start off with. But Jimmy sent me a note that was very authoritative. He says, this is Jerry's cell phone number. So I put that in my cell phone. I called it and it turned out it was home number. But we – because I've got more than a couple of years, I didn't wait there for four hours and develop a resentment. I called Jimmy, and then he he called Jerry, and we were together in about ten minutes, and it turns out we were only about 30 yards a, a, apart from each other where we were sitting there. And uh, so, but we've had a wonderful time. And I have to say, I've done a number of these Woodstocks, and this is extraordinary. Um, uh, this entire weekend has been extraordinary. Every presenter up here uh, has touched my heart. Um, there's much power in here. I know that a lot of the people in here haven't are not regular Woodstock attendees, and and uh, the enthusiasm in here is just incredible. And uh, Larry's gone, so I can use another Greek word, uh, but um, uh, enthusiasm um, comes from. You know, the first time I heard Larry speak was at at uh, uh, Clancy's 50th birthday celebration on the East Coast, and Clancy picked all the the speakers, and he picked all these California people and me. And uh, um, and so Larry spoke, and everybody Clancy 
picked, I'm a writer. Every one of us was a writer or somewhere around that field, except for Larry. And he was the most articulate of the whole group. And I said, afterwards, I said, what do you do? And I expect him to say, I'm a writer, I'm a teacher. Said, I'm a plumber. And uh, <laughs> so, um, but uh, anyway, it's, it's been a wonderful weekend. Um, this, I got sober in Louisville, Kentucky, and I went to 10 meetings a week. And nine of them were speaker meetings, and one of them was a 12 and 12, where we studied the 12 traditions and the 12 steps. Uh, and none of them were places where we uh, talked much during the meeting. All the speaker meetings, um, after you got sober your first year, you would start speaking. And we knew people because we heard them speak about every six months. And, and the great part of that, I believe that a speaker meeting is the very best way to convey both the process and the power of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, other things may work, and I'm sure people like discussion meetings, but I still go to mostly speaker meetings because I get to know the people. Our discussions take place when I was getting sober at the Howard Johnson's afterwards, and that's where one-on-one -on -one, I wasn't trying to impress somebody who was sitting on the other side of the room, whatever. I could ask stupid questions. Nobody made fun of me, and, and I got all the information I needed, but I got to hear this miracle that was there. And there's been a lot of talk about God all weekend, and, and this 12th step is all about God. Um, but the great thing about Alcoholics Anonymous, it came from a group called the Oxford Group. If you didn't hear uh, uh, Anna's presentation on Stepping Stones the other night. And the Oxford Group was simply a group of people that said the church is kind of dead. You go there and they go through all these things, but they've lost the miracle. And the big book says we still live in the age of miracles. Our own recovery proves that. And the reason is, I believe when they first started... When, when, you know, take it back 2,000 years ago, if you happen to be a member of that religion, uh, uh, and people were coming, they were meeting in Corinth, or they were meeting in someplace else, it was like a home group, but all they came in and, did and said was, I was blind, but now I see, I was lame, but now I walk. They shared their miracle, and nobody was an expert, nobody was teaching, you didn't have to go to somebody to find out what the book said. We were sharing our miracles one with another. And everybody who's been up here so far this weekend has shared miracles, things that took place in their life. And that's what keeps us sober. That's what keeps us coming back. You know, and the third step is, uh, is one of the worst contracts you will ever sign anywhere. Because it says, I don't have any rights to review anything. I give everything up, and God dictates all of the conditions. But in return... God takes care of my problems. And if I don't know, and I don't know anybody who ever takes that step who already is comfortable with God, and the only reason we do it is because we have no choice. It's either going to get worse or we turn our life over and we take that third step. But the reason I think we do take that third step is because we see these miracles. We see them not just at a podium. You see them walking into a home group. Some guy, and 10 days later, some guy that looks like he just got off the streets, and 10 days later he's shaved and, and cleaned up and, and starting to look like a regular human being. And we see that all the time in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I believe that's what the church was like in the beginning days. And there's such power in that. Um, in Theos, the Greek uh, enthusiasm comes from the Greek in Theos. It means God in us. And so when we see this great enthusiasm, that laughter and the thing that attracted me from the very beginning, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had brain damage. I'd been on the street. I hadn't had food for two years. All I'd done is live off whiskey. And, and I, I could not think straight. And you would talk to me, and I'd start crying at the wrong times and laughing at the wrong times. And nobody got mad at me. Nobody sent me out. Nobody said, shut up. I mean, they were speaker meetings, so they didn't really have to say shut up. I figured that out. And... So, but, but people loved me, and they made me feel like I was loved unconditionally. And that's what I got from the very beginning. And that's another quality of God. So, and I have to say, the, uh, the people, you, you've heard the case made for this 12-step from the beginning. Uh, Ron started with a, a, such a powerful uh, presentation of hopelessness. And, um, and, I, and I also think that the great part about Alcoholics Anonymous is nobody's professional. Ron got straight off a plane, put a suit on, and came up here and shared from his heart. Was he under a lot of stress? No. Were maybe they irritated about a couple things? Yeah, but we know that God's going to work things out. You cannot mess up an A meeting if everybody shows up. If somebody's sick, somebody else will step in and replace them. Uh, and so Ron talked about this hopelessness enough that he was able to surrender and realize, and Mari uh, demonstrated the, the 
uh, insanity uh, that uh, we've come to know in Alcoholics Anonymous. She always does when she speaks. Um, she demonstrates enough insanity that we know we should surrender. Um, and, and there are two people I hadn't met before this weekend, Mickey and Peter, and I just love both of them. I love their presentations. I, I love spending time with them. Um, and Mickey uh, made the case for why we should accept such a one-sided contract in the third step. Uh, Ralph, the painful process of self-honesty, which is the hardest thing for me. When I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought honesty was me telling you maybe something that you needed to know about you. That was my idea of honesty <laughs> because I was being helpful. But self-honesty, honest to God, I was arrested 22 times. I was arrested for felonies. I was arrested for assault and battery on a police officer. I was defiant. I had a problem with defiance. But the worst things that I did were the way I treated my mother and my father and my brother and my sister. It took me six or seven years before I realized all these fashionable, uh, bizarre things that I got involved in were not the most critical things in my life. The things that I'd done were how I had injured my relationship with my mother and my father, my brother and my sister, and how I had walked away from a pot potential relationship with God. When I got here, I had no real relationship with God except that I thought God existed. I was not, not an atheist nor agnostic, but I thought God was a punishing God, and I also thought God loved certain people and he picked you, but he didn't pick me. Bob shared more about the surrender and the willingness to change in 5, 6, and 7. And Larry, I've never heard Larry that funny before. He was tremendous last night, and it was a great time to be that funny Saturday night's the time. And, um, but he passionately, also passionately portrayed uh, the prom promises coming through and what happened with his family and with his dad and with his mother. And Peter this morning about maintaining that daily contact with the God, that conscious contact, the presence that becomes the most important thing in our life. And that's what I'm really to talk about. This is the payoff of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the 12th step. It says that we, having had a spiritual awakening, which I cannot have unless I'm willing to surrender absolutely to these steps and take the actions in these steps. And I can tell you that everything that I sense now in my presence, is absolutely 180 degrees from what I, I thought when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I was so wrong about everything. And the reason for that was I was thinking through my human alcoholic mind. And I believe that the spiritual awakening, we become spiritual beings having a human experience, not the other way around. And as a spiritual being, I am like a cell phone. Cell phone by itself, mate, well, now they're pretty neat on their own. They've got whatever's programmed in there. But they don't really work until you connect to a greater intelligence. You turn that cell phone on and it connects to some kind of uh, super satellite network and now you're in touch with people. You have intelligence. You know what's going on. We can, on that cell phone, check into our flight. We know what the weather's going to be like along the way. We know that my college got beat 38 to 7 last night. We know... <laughs> We know the Boise State fell out, Georgia won. You know, you can pick up all kinds of stuff. I've got people that are sending me things that I need to do on a film edit, actually, so that I can review some edited film that's going to come in. I look at it. It's all this intelligent comes in. But it wasn't that long ago. When I was growing up, you know, you just had a dial phone. And you had a party line. When I was a kid, we had a party line. So you'd pick it up, and your neighbor was on the same line, which was kind of fun to listen in on. So... <laughs> But that's changed, and that is the way Alcoholics Anonymous has changed the way I see things. I can tell if I am in a spiritual place when I walk into my home group and I sit around and I see the same guy that gets up and says the exact same thing uh, every time, and, and I sit there. If I sit there and I'm critical of him because he's going to say the exact same thing when it comes to him, then that's me. If I sit there and I look at him and I am so grateful for him because he's consistent and I know that on Friday night he takes a meeting to a treatment center and I know that he goes to a jail on Saturday night and I know that he's got this routine and that he helps a lot of people and I'm grateful for him and I'm grateful for him, him as a gift in my life, that's God. I can tell whether I'm spiritually fit by the way I look at others. If I am critical or judgmental of you, that's me. If I am grateful to know that you are my brother or sister and that we have the same father and we are God's children, 
That's God. And the only way I get that and then get any wisdom like that is not my wisdom. It is my mind opens up. We tried to carry this message to alcoholics. That's what I think most of us think of as 12-step work. And certainly what I thought of as 12-step work for a long time. I stopped drinking and I tried to help everybody else stop drinking. And in my case, I tried to help everybody else stop drinking. Anybody who drank, I tried to help them stop drinking. And that's what I did for a long time. And to practice these principles in all our affairs, that I had no clue of. I had no clue what the principles were, and I, and I just thought that meant that I was supposed to help people stay sober. Well, I can tell you that if I had the meaning of life, and I did a great deal of research early on, I'm a seeker. I'm somebody who always thought I was looking for some kind of uh, relationship with God from the very beginning. I, I, I did not fit in with my family. Uh, it's Veterans Day, and I'd like to do one thing, if you don't mind, uh, because I honor, I, I have two tours in combat and everybody in my family, and I know what it takes. Would all the veterans in the room stand up, please? <laughs> I don't know how I got like I am, self-centered, uh, absorbed with me, I don't know how I got that way because I didn't come from that kind of family. And this is how sick I was. I was embarrassed to tell people what kind of family I was from for many years because we were all military. And I went to a kind of a, I was a bright kid, and my dad got me into a school that was for kids that were bright, and most of them were going off. Their parents owned the businesses and so forth, and I didn't have the money they had, and so I figured I didn't have the value that they had. And uh, here's the family that I came from. My name is Dick Anderson. My dad... Um, one of the most decorated World War II veterans. He was shot down behind uh, Nazi lines, and he was a B-25 pilot, later a test pilot, flew with Chuck Yeager. Um, got the Army Cross, which is next to the Medal of Honor, two silver stars. Uh, I got to meet some of the people whose lives he saved. Uh, at the, he has bomb wing reunion. They're all 90 now, and they're in their 90s. None of them, I'm deaf. They can't hear at all. And so I got to meet some of them and found out that he pulled a guy out of a burning airplane and didn't even know about that. I knew about some of the things because there were citations, but he didn't mention any of those things. That's my dad. Um, but his grandfather, my great-grandfather, was General Dick Anderson, who was a three-star general under Robert E. Lee, and his cousin out of the same, they both had the same grandfather. Uh, the first one was Richard Chloe Anderson. We're all Scottish. Uh, Richard Chloe Anderson was born in uh, Hanover County in 1750. He was Captain Dick Anderson who commanded the first boat across the Delaware on Christmas Day in 1776 and pushed the Hessians back to uh, Princeton. And uh, uh, that was the family that I came from. My little sister is a retired bird colonel with honors. Her husband is a retired bird colonel with honors and two tours in Vietnam. Their boy graduated from West Point. The grand generation that we have right now, we've got several Marines and several uh, Green Berets on active duty. Our family just does service. And we've been doing it for a long time without any fanfare. And they don't, I don't know one of them belongs to the VFW or goes drinking at the American Legion. They just do it. They come back. They believe we're put here on earth to serve others. And that's the family that I came from that I was embarrassed to talk about. And now it's a great source of, of comfort to me. And I'm not like them. I would like to be like them. I'm not. But I can tell stories about people who are like them. I make my living as a writer. Um, I had two tours in Vietnam and I did okay while I was there, but I'm not like them. I'm not a hero, but they are. And that's the family I came from. And they set a role model for me. But because I felt like I was different from them from the very beginning, I, I stayed away from, from that family. I felt isolated. I didn't tell them what was going on. We have somebody in, in Alcoholics Anonymous, you have somebody called a sponsor. I had nobody that I could tell the things that I tell my sponsor about when I was a kid. Because I was afraid if I told people what I really felt like, they wouldn't accept me. And so, I ended up uh, just isolating, playing a role. The big book says we play a role, and that's exactly what I did. Um, the same time I was growing up, there were TV shows. This became the one area of comfort, and it's the one area where God reached me, and it's what I do for a living now. Uh, there were TV shows that were coming out, and they were actually pretty good moral, moral teachers. It was Andy Griffith, uh, Leave it to Beaver, Ozzie and Harriet, Father Knows Best, and they became my moral compass. While I couldn't tell anything to, to uh, my Boy Scout leader or my dad or anybody else, I wouldn't tell them what was going on with me, I would sit and watch one of these shows, and if Opie or Wally ever got in any kind of trouble, by, Dad would just take his pipe and turn it to one side, and by the end of the show, 
Opie or Wally had caught, caught on whatever Dad was saying, his wisdom, without any kind of judgment, and they would be back on the beam. And so that became my moral compass. Whenever I had a problem, I took it to these guys on TV. And actually, if you are disassociated from people, you know, other things become your reality. And my reality was what was on TV. I mean, I lived in a fantasy life from the very beginning. That's just the way I was. Uh, but I did see that in my family and elsewhere, they talked even on TV. They talked a lot about God. And so I thought my problem was I wasn't connected to God. So we went to uh, the drive-in when I was six years old, and I was in the back seat with my sister, the later-to-be-retired colonel, and my dad, the colonel. And, and we're, we're at this, and there, I had TV back in those days with little black and white things. So I'd never seen anything more than black and white. Now I'm seeing something that's in color. And not only is it in color, it's in technicolor, and it's 120 feet wide. The big book says, lack of power is our dilemma. Um, in fact, if you're not sure what the, the, the purpose of the big book is, it says more than that. It says lack of power. That was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously, but where and how were we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. This book is about finding a relationship with God. You've heard it a lot throughout this weekend, but I go to a lot of AA meetings, a lot of AA conferences where people talk about everything but that. But in the big book, it says, stress the spiritual aspect freely with the new man. Religion has nothing to do with this. It's that is there a power greater than us. That's exactly what this book is about. So I lacked power. I felt like I didn't have what the rest of my family had. And that night on that screen, I saw the power I was looking for. And there was a guy up there. The name of the movie was The Ten Commandments. And there was a guy up there named Moses. And he had a staff. And all he had to do was push it to one side. And the wind would start blowing through his hair. And the Red Sea would part. And I said, that's the kind of power I'd like to have. <laughs> so the next day, much to the surprise of my parents, who didn't know I was having a spiritual awakening in the back of the 55 Ford, <laughs> when they played I Surrender All at this little Baptist church, I walked down the aisle and I surrendered all. I'm here. And I'm like the newcomer who comes to AA and think we come in, we go to 90 meetings, 90 days, we do everything, we get a job. To... But I wasn't taking any steps to change. And because I didn't take any steps to change, and because I didn't have a sponsor I could tell what I was going on inside of me, after a few days, weeks, whatever it was, I was still the scared little Baptist Boy Scout. But you were smiling, and you were having fun, and you were enjoying going to church, and you had a family. And so I felt like I didn't. For whatever reason, God wanted you, but he didn't want me. And I made a decision right then that God didn't want me, and if he didn't want me, I didn't want him. And I was six or seven years old. And that's the way I lived my life until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, my next spiritual experience, I was 14, and a buddy of mine uh, named Dave, I'm a baseball player, and I played football, and, and I, this, we had a Babe Ruth League baseball game, and I, I at our family reunions, we had iced tea and lemonade. So... I wasn't around liquor, and Dave, uh, older brother, got us a six-pack of beer and a half pint of gin. And he drank the gin, and I drank the beer. And I don't know which beer it was or where it was along the way, but suddenly I felt like I was about six foot tall, and the wind was blowing through my hair, and I didn't have a stick, but I had a, a but I had a Hank Aaron baseball bat. And we, you know, from the very beginning, I was not a stay-at-home drunk; I was a go-to-town drunk. And going to town when you're 14 means hitchhiking. We hitchhiked up to a little place called uh, the White Castle. And I don't know if they have them around here, but uh, okay. It's where you go when you're drunk when you want a dozen cheeseburgers. <laughs> Which seemed like a good idea when you're drunk at 3 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> but not so much the next day. And so, anyway, so my buddy and I, we hitchhiked up to, to uh, White Castle. Now I was very shy. I was reticent to talk to anybody who was an adult that wasn't my own age, that wasn't good friends with. We go up there, I discovered table hopping. This is the night I discovered. So I'm bouncing around, I'm talking to people. And back in those days, adults wore hats and ties and smoked pipes. I mean, it was a different, you know, it wasn't a casual society. So they were in there, and I'm talking to them and, and uh, having a good time. And my buddy Dave is not having the same spiritual experience I am. Dave is feeling a little woozy. And I had, I had seen in Perry Mason, I'd never had a cup of coffee, but I had seen in Perry Mason when you have too much to drink, you have a cup of coffee, and it sobers you up so you can talk to the police. So I ordered a cup of it, – it's going to come in handy in a minute. So, I, so I, I ordered a cup of coffee for my buddy Dave, and it didn't have the desired effect. Dave threw up down the counter right in front of a very attractive redhead that I was flirting with. 
And um, so as it turns out, if you're looking for a Louisville City policeman at midnight, the best place to find them is at the White Castle. So two of them came down. I would have been scared to death to talk to these adults, much less policemen, before. But I just stand up, and he said, what's the matter with your friend? Oh, he's just had a little bit too much to drink. Really? Well, how old is he? 14. How old are you? 14. So I was in Louisville City Jail four hours after my first drink. And that was pretty much the end of my social drinking. I drank as much as I could whenever I could from that point on. But what I had found was something in spirit, it is distilled spirits, that made me feel the way I thought someone felt like Moses or someone who had power. It it took away the fear. It took away the concern. I wasn't, all the burden I was carrying just fell off. And from the very beginning, I could not wait to get another drink. Um, during the first three times I drank, I drank that beer, got, got arrested. Nobody in our family had ever been arrested. Uh, obviously, it didn't go over well at home. Within just a short time, um, by the time I got to alcohol, it's anonymous, I had been arrested 22 times. I was not arrested. I was only arrested once for DUI. Out of those 22 times I was arrested, and I wasn't arrested for any intelligent crimes. I knew New Jersey, there's a training pool for that. But I wasn't in, in, uh, arrested for any intelligent crimes or anything that made money. I was, I was arrested for defiance. I was the guy where if you were pulled over on the side of the road and by a state trooper, I would pull in behind a state trooper, walk up and say, Officer, what's the problem? <laughs> and I'm in high school and I've been drinking country club malt liquor all afternoon. So my buddies loved me because they ended up going home, and I was the one that was in handcuffs when they carried me off because I lived this way and because I was defiant. What I found out about defiance is, you know, if you're looking for a definition of humility, because we seek that, and we, in, in fact, you're afraid to say, I know what humility is or I don't know what humility is because if we actually say we know what it is, then we're not humble, the whole thing. And uh, tell them we're having a meeting. And so, um, uh, so but if, if it, the... Humility and defiance are the exact opposites. The way I can tell if I am humble, if I'm not defiant, if I'm when we come into a program where in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 traditions, everything we do is so that we turn our life over to the will of God. Not our will and asking God to help us with our will, but we ask God how we are to live. We ask God how we are to run our groups, our families, and if you carry them over into your own, our families, all of that. But defiance says nobody's going to tell me what to do. So the one defining characteristic of the alcoholic is that we are a defiant lot. And yet we have a disease which calls for us to absolutely toss that away and say, I absolutely do not want to do what I want to do. I want to do what God wants me to do. I don't, that transition can't even happen on our own. It, acts, it has to have a power other than us because there's no way my mind would change that much. That's why I don't believe the word recovered, which is not used a lot, But recovered is true because I was never had anything to recover back to. I was never at at peace with God. I was never at peace with people. I found a whole new way of living, a whole new design for living, as it says in the big book, where it is my benefit to want what God wants for me because when I do, I'm at peace and I trust God. Do I do that every day? No. Do I try to? Yes. So because of the way I lived, I ended up, uh, my dad said, if you're going to act that way, you're not going to be able to live in this house. So I found an apartment when I was 15 or 16 with other kids, older kids, and got that apartment. I would come home long enough just to blackmail my mother emotionally so I could get something from her or my dad occasionally, but usually when my dad wasn't there. By the time I was, uh, so they rarely knew where I was. My senior year, I got locked up 16, uh, 12 times. And uh, my parents found out where I was after prom night um, because uh, I was locked up at my senior prom for two counts of assault and battery on a police officer. And now I'm 18, so it's no longer a juvenile charge. And I'm put in the felon tank. And we have something in Louisville at the same time we have proms, which is called the Kentucky Derby. And so um, I thought I knew all about race relations because I went to high school with two black kids and I got along with them. This was in the 60s, and so uh, my parents found out where I was the next day, as many others did, because they brought me out on, uh, they put me in a cell the night before with seven Black Panthers who were in Louisville, Kentucky, to blow up Churchill Downs. It was a big thing that happened in the 60s. 
It made the national news. So the next day on ABC, CBS, and NBC News, there are the seven Black Panthers and Dickie <laughs> in his little powder blue tuxedo jacket. On national news, <laughs> and I began to be proud of defiance. And I don't know whether you've noticed that we've got some groups in AA that are proud of being defiant. We tried to join a group that was out near our neighborhood when we moved out there before we went, went to this one at Powder Springs. And they were proud of saying, nobody can tell us what we, to do in AA. That's not what the traditions say. That's not what the steps say. But there's this attitude sometimes that, that nobody can tell us what to do, that we are autonomous. But everything I do affects my family, affects you. The big book says that the, the, what I do says a lot more than what I say. How I live is much more important than what I say. And I had no idea how to live. So by the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had worked in New York for a little while. I was, uh, I was very good at what I did. I had two tours in Vietnam. I did okay in Vietnam. Um, and uh, uh, probably the genetic pool that I belonged to. But as soon as I got out, I knew I wasn't going to stay there. And uh, for one thing, my idea of a breakfast meeting is 1030. And so I got out. I go back to my hometown of Louisville. I fall in love with a beautiful woman. Everybody I ever fell in love with in my early days, I was engaged six times before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. Nobody would actually marry me, but I had a lot of engagements. And uh, I met a girl that was absolutely beautiful. My drinking buddy was a gunny. Um, and uh, he lived downstairs from a, a girl who lived upstairs, introduced me when I came back to Louisville. We both came back from Vietnam at the same time and got out, discharged. And she was absolutely beautiful. She looked like a girl named Olivia Newton-John that performed back then. And so I, fe I saw her. I fell in love with her. And, and uh, we were getting ready to make plans about our life together. We just needed to figure out what to do with her husband. And um, <laughs> he was an advanced man for Nixon. And Nixon was running for re-election. And he and I had had some run-ins, and I was an expert marksman when I was on active duty, so I went after him a few times with a shotgun. He was an attorney. He came after me a few times with a warrant. <laughs> but you would think the first time you get locked up and you get locked up for a certain kind of defiance that you would figure that out, that you don't do that again. But I had no choice. I believe without a spiritual connection, we absolutely have to be defiant because the only way that I can be at peace here with God and with you is to absolutely trust that this power is going to take care of me. I, how am I going to trust you that you're not going to take away what I need unless I believe that we're children of the same Father who's going to give what, each one of us what we need? Now, you know, they've been t saying that in church. I heard that in church. didn't sink in. I was a member of the Boy Scouts. I was a member of the YMCA. I was a member of Little League. Boy Scouts says the way we please God best is by doing something to help someone each day anonymously. Exactly what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. All this stuff was out there, but it didn't sink into me. And if you're an alcoholic like I am, it probably didn't sink into you. And the only way to get it was for me to act my way into right thinking. That's what they told me was going to happen. And I don't think I acted in a way that changed my brain. I think I acted in a way that allowed my human nature to be subdued long enough that I could connect with God and, and become the spiritual being that I was supposed to be. I have a soul sickness. I have a soul wellness. My life is built around my soul today. I have a soul mate. And she spoke yesterday. We had some, and by the way, we had some great speakers uh, all weekend, but I, I must say that the Alnon speaker was the best one. <laughs> No, I must say that the al speaker is the best one. <laughs> I forget that sometimes. But, um, but my, my, the, the relationship between my dad and I, my little brother now, thanks to you, he's a different kind of alcoholic than I am altogether. I, was, I had no social drinking, as you can tell. He drank socially for a while and then developed into an alcoholic, and he got sober three years ago. And when he came to AA, some, one of the guys that I helped get sober in Louisville Burns was uh, there to help him get sober. And you did that for him. But I went to an AA meeting with him recently, and he sat there and he said, 
I grew up in a household that was torn apart by arguments all the time, and it was just just uh, one disaster every day, and I was scared, and I stayed in my room. Well, I was the disaster. My dad, who didn't tolerate foolishness very well, and I, when I was around there, got into close to fistfights every time I was home after I started drinking. And today I love my father very much. And you know the funny thing was, with most of us, we want our fathers to be proud of us. More than anything else, we want a, lo- a loving Heavenly Father and our real fathers to be proud of us, with guys especially. The one thing I want is for my dad to think well of me. And I did everything I could to ensure that that wasn't going to happen. Defiance takes me and puts me in positions where I can't believe I do what I do. But I don't know how else we would live if we don't have any trust in some God that's bigger than all of us. And that's why God is the solution. So I I finally, my last two years after, I, I worked in New York for a while. I worked at uh, an agency over there. I did Coca-Cola's advertising. Got a couple of Clio's. I did the spot with the football player and the kid and all that that you see trotted out at Superdome. I had plenty of talent. I had a job where I could work an hour and a half a day. They thought I was off creating. And, um, but I did get fired. I didn't get fired from agency jobs. I didn't get fired for drinking, though. I got fired for, they said, you, you missed 111 days this year. Now, I don't know how many work days there are in a year, but it seemed like that would be a large percentage of them. And um, so they said, you're great when you're here, but you don't show up. They didn't, even, they didn't and then they tried to give me help. I didn't need help. No, thank you. So they fired me. And they actually didn't fire me. They moved me from New York down to Atlanta. That's what happens when you're bad. You get moved from New York down to Atlanta. They tried to work me on the Coca-Cola down down there. I didn't last very long. And I spent my last two years in a uh, small basement apartment. Um, and I had lost the ability to control my kidneys and bowels. I was hallucinating. I heard things come through in the heating duct. I wasn't eating food. And I was uh, would get up and I would shake a drink until I stopped shaking and get something down. I actually slept and lived on the bathroom floor. I was close to the toilet, and I had a black and white TV. And the only time I got up from that room to go any place was to go to the liquor store. And on June 8, 1977, I'd been evicted from my apartment. And I walked up to the liquor store, and the guy at the liquor store said, we know these checks are no good, and we need to ask you not to come into our liquor store anymore. And... As degrading as that was, and knowing I'd be living on the streets, the only thing I could think of was, oh, God, I hope he gives me that whiskey. And he did give me some whiskey, and I walked around a corner. At that point, I had one blue shirt. I had a pair of yellowish-brownish pants, uh, which I got because they were supposed to be country club colors, but actually it was kind of a practical application. And I had a pair of Weegians that loafers that had holes in the bottom. But I carried a 45. I was getting really paranoid my last two or three years, and I carried a 45 all the time, loaded. And I went around the corner, and I had that bottle, and the bottle fell out of my hands, and it hit the concrete. And it was just like in slow motion. And I was more afraid and more hopeless in that moment than I ever was in a firefight in Vietnam. Because I had no idea how to live without alcohol. And I just started screaming at the top of my lungs at what, at this power that I thought had caused all these problems in my life who didn't accept me and why did he accept you and he didn't accept me. I had spent so long, even drunk, trying to find this power. I did graduate work in intercultural studies. I studied Eastern religions and Western religions. I was reading Edgar Cayce books. I was reading Thomas Merton. I remember one week I read Thomas Merton, Edgar Cayce, uh, and Billy Graham all in the same week. I was finding in any place that I could go, I was trying to find something to take this upheaval out of my life. And I just started screaming and yelling because when I, when I dropped that liquor, I knew there was only one way out. And I pulled the 45 out and I had it round in the chamber and took the safety off and I got ready to pull the trigger. And then I started screaming at God because I was going to, I was 27 years old. And I was getting ready to walk out without ever having done any of the things I really wanted to do. Because God didn't like me. And I started screaming, God blanket, God blanket, God blanket. And something broke and I said, God help me. God help me. God help me. And a scene from Days of Wine and Roses, a movie that I'd seen many, many times, which was written by one of our members, 
was there to carry the message to me. This is 12-step work. And in that movie, it shows AA meetings, and it showed the steps and the traditions on the walls, and it shows how we go and work with a newcomer, and it shows the problems of, of hanging out, going back and trying to get with your wife. I mean, it's, I think it's the best movie that's ever been made about the, the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's poetry, and it was a great play before it was a, but it was written by one of our members. And the scene from that movie where Jack Klugman walks up to Jack Lemon and says, I understand you need help. I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous, came to me. And it was like real life. I, I couldn't tell what was real and wasn't, but this seemed real to me. And I saw it. And I walked up to a phone booth on a street corner. And I didn't have a nickel or dime, and I called the operator. And because somebody had done some 12-step work and made sure that the op, this was 34 and a half years ago, somebody had made sure that the people that even worked the phones knew what Alcoholics Anonymous was. This woman said, just a minute. Because I was crying. I just called up the operator and said, I'm crying and I'm an alcoholic. She said, just a minute. And she connected me with a woman named Helen. And Helen had uh, nine years and she had just taken a job the year before running uh, Atlanta Central Office. And Helen is one of my best friends. And... Uh, I will see her in another week or two at the Woodstock we do. And Helen is still sober. And Helen said, I know you're in trouble. You just wait right there. And she sent on a guy named Ed to 12-step me. And Ed was a guy I normally would not have associated with. As you can tell by my story, I was well-traveled and hip. <laughs> Ed worked for the railroad. He had a bad toupee. He smoked a pipe. He looked like Bob, you know, the Bob in all the ads. And um, uh, and so, uh, and he came out. He was living, he was a year and a half sober. He was living in a one-room apartment with a hot plate. But he was coming to help me. And uh, he had a, I remember he had a, my, my reservation was, uh, well, I had many reservations, but one was that he had a plaid shirt and some striped pants. Now, I'm getting ready to kill myself, but do I turn myself over to a guy in a bad ensemble? <laughs> Some things you just don't do. And Ed sat down and he started sharing with me. He didn't tell me about me. In fact, nobody had said anything nice about me in some time. I hadn't worked in a while. All my relationships were gone. I hadn't seen my family. Um... And uh, he said, what do you do? And I started crying. I said, I think I'm alcoholic. He said, no, I mean, what did you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm, 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 don't work. He said, what did you do for a living? I said, well, I was a writer. And he said, well, what have you written? And I told him a couple of things. He said, oh, God's given you a lot of talent. He wants to keep you around so that you can use that talent to help others. That's the only thing he said directly to me. And nobody had said anything nice to, about me or to me in a long time. But he had read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he didn't lecture me. He shared the horrors of his past. And even though we were very different, I trusted him because the heart speaks to the heart, and I knew that he had gone through what I went through. And I got in a car with him, and he took me to a place to dry out because I was going into DTs. And on the way there, uh, there was a... Uh, an ATM machine, which they just come out with ATM machines. I got sober the year that Star Wars came out, and they came out with ATM machines. And Elvis died. Those were my... And so, uh, um, but, but they had an ATM machine, which I didn't know about, obviously. Um, and, he, and he said, I'm going to uh, stop in here and, and get uh, uh, $20. And I said, with what? And he showed me this card. And I said, well, if I had one of those, I probably wouldn't need AA. But um, <laughs> apparently, well, I was not on their list. So... He goes to, he said, will you be okay? Well, he, he was a year and a half sober. He lived in a one-room apartment with a hot plate, but he had a brand new car. You know how we are. And so um, <laughs> it wasn't much of a car. It was a Pinto, but it had the, it still had the sticker on the side. And so he said, will you be okay? Well, June the 8th is hot sometimes in Atlanta. And um, so uh, he, he um, gets out. And by the time he came back, I had gotten sick, and I couldn't get the door open. I threw up down the inside of his window and, and all in the car. And the only thing that Ed did with me at a year and a half sober
almost put his arm around me and say, it's going to be okay. It's going to get better from here. Because Ed knew that we don't have anything, a place to stay, a car, friends, fellowship, anything, unless we're willing to help another alcoholic. And he took me to a place to dry out, and I had DTs for four or five days. They gave me phenobarb or something to stop the DTs, but it didn't really, I think it subdues them so you don't die. But I did. And uh, there was an old guy named Joe Hubbard in, in Atlanta that had been around for a long time. He'd been dead for 15 years, but he had 35 years or something at that time, which was a long time. And he just held on to my hand. You know, when somebody has DTs and when they go into delusions, if you make human contact with them, just human contact, that takes them out of the delusions. And so he sat with me, and uh, several people sat with me for several days. And um, I didn't have any insurance. I lied about having that. Certainly didn't have any money. But they arranged for me to go back to my hometown, Louisville, Kentucky. The big book says when we take that third step, we have a new employer. He takes care of everything if we're just willing to do what he asks. And all I knew to do at that point, I had brain damage. I had trouble. If you started a sentence... Two sentences down, I was confused about what you were saying, so it was difficult for me to do anything. Somebody provided me a car, an old car, to drive up there to drop off and give to somebody else. I got back to Louisville, and I got in there, and uh, I ended up living in the basement. We didn't have a treatment center at that time. There was a basement that somebody had uh, set up. It was kind of a little recovery room, and they had a couple of cots, and I slept on one of them, and I'd stay up at night helping alcoholics stay sober, and I didn't realize what a gift that was. One of the biggest things I think we miss now calling my today is uh, working with wet drunks, brand-new wet drunks, because you see them go from their absolute worst within just a few days to looking like a human being. And we sometimes delegate that to treatment centers. And treatment centers do a great job, but it's great if you can be around wet drunks and work with them. And that's how I stayed sober. My first year or two was just working with wet drunks. They took me on 12-step calls. We went looking. We'd spend three or four hours driving to find some place who needed our help. Today, people gripe and, and whine because uh, a, a treatment center delivers 30 guys that, that all are potential 12-step calls, and they bring them right to your doorstep, and people gripe about them. But then we would drive any place to go get one of these people to work with, and that helped me stay sober. And I couldn't think, so I couldn't work. But I had room and board for staying at this house, and I made my cigarette money. I started smoking cigarettes after seeing The Graduate ten times, and, uh, and also had an affair with an older woman. She'd be about 89 now. <laughs> so when I when I went, I'm, I'm smoking cigarettes and I and I I'm, I'm, I went from three packs a day to four packs a day. When you get sober, it accelerates your um, nicotine velocity or something. But anyway, so I started smoking more, smoking L and M's, and I and and uh, I, I I I will tell you that between six and seven, it says if we have something we will not let go of, we ask God to help us become willing. And that's not my step, but I want to tell you that I never liked smoking. I, I started because of the, uh, the movie, and then I, you know, it's pretty addictive. So uh, I asked God to help me become willing for a year, and at the end of that year, everything that I could possibly do, burn my suit, everything. And I had my last year got on October 18, 1978, and that was because I worked the principles of this program. You want to smoke, that's your business, but this works on everything. So I'm smoking, and I make my cigarette money by working – pouring coffee at a place where they had a hot plate in a, uh, an AA club. And the most important thing was that I had a job in my home group. And because of my brain damage and I didn't think my cognitive skills weren't that good, they would not let me um, uh, do anything with math, uh, like make the coffee. And, um, <laughs> but in Louisville at that time, uh, if you didn't smoke, it was mandatory that you learned how to smoke. And so I was the ashtray guy. And I cleaned these ashtrays that were red, gold, blue, and uh, green. And they looked like Christmas tree colors. And they were made out of this metal that's kind of corrugated. And they engineered so that the cigarette ashes actually fused with the metal. And I had a Brillo, I had a Brillo pad and a, an SOS pad. And I got in there. And I kept these ashtrays. Uh, you know, there were, we, had, uh, we had ten ashtrays. And I kept them absolutely sparkling. And uh, since I smoked, I knew people were going to use them, so I didn't get, but I had them, and I was really, a, I was a good ashtray guy, and I was more proud of being the ashtray guy in my home group than I had been of the youngest creative director at McCann Erickson up in New York years ago and winning Cleo's and stuff because one was real and wasn't, one wasn't. I didn't know what I did when I was drinking, but this was real, and I was valuable. And that's where we find our joy in Alcoholics Anonymous. We learn it from the very beginning. The most I can become in Alcoholics Anonymous is useful. 
the most I can become on the planet is useful. God has given me certain talents. I write and produce. We're getting ready to, uh, my partner and I are getting ready to do a TV show, a series that will come out, and each week you will hear stories like you hear from up here. They will be real AA stories. And you'll recognize some of the people, but we change the name of the place to make sure that we maintain our an- anonymity. But right now, out, si- out there, if you look at TV, people are uh, seeing shows that pretend like what we do to get sober is get in a room and scream and yell at each other and, and uh, tell each other what to do and go to these intervention things and get sober. That's not Alcoholics Anonymous. It has nothing to do with spirituality. It has nothing to do with God. So we're going to do a TV show. I'm using my talent in that area. I've used my talent for other things. But when I came in, I couldn't use that talent. So I needed something where I could be useful. And I was the ashtray guy. There is a job for you from the very, very beginning, but it's going to change. And when it does change, it's called rotation. And so they uh, came up to me and said, this is where none of us get a job for very long, so our ego, you know, how we are, so we don't take over uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. And they came up and they said, we got a new ashtray guy. His name is Raymond. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> they said, no, Raymond needs this job like you did when you first got here. I mean, you know how they do that. And you can't, well, you know. so... Raymond needs this job. And I said, well, what am I going to do? They said, we want you to be the, the, the chairperson. I'm going to be the chairperson? No, the chairperson. You're going to set up the chairs. But, so, I, you know, they used to have, a, a, of all the easy does and everything, they used to have another one that said, think, think, think. I think they've taken those down in most AA houses now, but it said, think, think, think. So I'm thinking, thinking. There were only 10 ashtrays. There are 40 chairs. So this is a promotion. <laughs> so what? if you are willing to be useful after your time is up at one job, they will find something else for you to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. But along this route, I did what they told me to do. I tried to work the steps, but I tried to work them with brain damage, and I could only remember one girl that I resented, and she was on each of my first three inventories. And obviously, I don't remember her name now, but apparently we didn't get along all that well. And so... By the time I started to clear up and my brain started clearing up and I, and I, and I ended up uh, getting a real live job, uh, I did my inventory and I realized that I was angry at everybody. I was angry at God. I was angry at my parents. I was angry at women who went out with men who I knew weren't really treating them right. And I was angry with the men who would lie. Dude, I, I gave every bit of power in this universe because I didn't have a relationship with God. I gave to you. If I wanted to tell you what the meaning of life is that I've been searching for all that time, it's in the big book. There is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Because if God has all power, that means I have no power. But if I work the steps, I... Become aware that I am God's son. I am God's child. My Heavenly Father will give me what I need. The other thing that does for me is it means you have no power. You cannot ruin my life. Nobody in this room can ruin my life. And all the time and energy I had spent trying to manipulate you so you would like me, accept me, or battling you because I didn't like you and I thought you could do me harm, or resenting you or hating you, was a waste of time. Because you don't have any power. If I was going to climb up to a mountaintop and I'd been looking at all these Eastern religions and reading everything that they say, I could never find anything that powerful. And I had to come to Alcoholics Anonymous as a street drunk to find out the answer to all the questions I'd been asking in college, in graduate work, in the world, in life, with people. And this is where I found it. And as my brain got better, I started working. I got through the amends process, and that's where the real miracle started. And that's my spiritual awakening anyway started taking place. And I was the benefit and would not have gotten here if it hadn't been for the 12 star of many of you. The first time I heard an AA story was at a, a, with a bunch of Marines. A, a, this guy, my drinking buddy, and I are in the back of the room. We just came back from Vietnam. We got our sunglasses on had a couple of cocktails. We had to go to a mandatory drug abuse seminar. So if you're going to one of those, you have a couple of cocktails. And I didn't, I didn't do drugs, by the way, uh, because uh, I thought if you did drugs, you lacked self-discipline. And so um, 
and I'm not saying that I didn't smoke a few joints or accidentally do LSD on a plane ride one time, but um, <laughs> but well, I was a wild turkey guy. So anyway, but my buddy, the gunny, was a, who was older than me, and I thought it was kind of funny, but he would always get a roach or something and smoke it on the way to, kept it in his little tie tack. You know, we were real neat and it was under the tie tack. So anyway, so we get there, and this is a mandatory drug abuse seminar, and a guy stands up and he says, uh, my name is Charles, and I'm an alcoholic, but I don't drink anymore because I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember every word this guy said, and that was six years before I got sober. If he had not talked to me, I might not have known that there was some place I could go when I got ready to pull the trigger. Every time we carry the message to somebody, and that's why I do DUI schools. DUI schools are not happy to see us come and share about the, the joy of Alcoholics Anonymous. But we're planting seeds, and somebody planted a seed with me uh, at a military base. And he had done that for me. And now I'm able to go with these guys, and we start doing 12-step work, and we start these other things. And now I, I'm making my amends, and I'm going back. And I made an amends to uh, this Baptist church, and I got up on a Sunday night. And this is where the big breakthrough came through for me. When I first got into Alcoholics Anonymous, I learned how to love a new drunk unconditionally. And from that practice, eventually I learned to make amends and love my family and other people. But I still had a problem with God. I was asking God every morning to keep me sober and thanking God at night. And I was still afraid of God and didn't trust God. I was doing it because you told me and it was working. But I had a big gap between me and God. And so I ended up... making amends to this Baptist church. And on that Sunday night, when I got up to share with uh, the congregation. There was a beautiful blonde in the congregation who had never heard anybody apologize to a Baptist church before or since. And she was your Al-Anon speaker yesterday morning. I was looking for a meaningful relationship. Uh, Barbara was not what I was looking for. She was a good girl and a seminary student. I was looking for a new dancer who needed spiritual guidance. But because I didn't do the picking, and God did, we've been married for 27 years. She's as active in al -Anon as I am in AA. She's a past delegate. And we love each other. We, have, we support each other. And I had one more church to go back to, and this is one of the pivotal points in my, my life. I went back to this church to apologize to them. And I couldn't find anybody to make amends to. This is the church that my dad still belongs to. My mom died six years ago. My dad is 90. He got married, remarried when he was 88 to a younger woman. She's 78. And um, she's about 10 years younger. And uh, he still goes to this church. And they're Scottish. It's a Presbyterian church. And um, I had defaced that church. I was so angry at God. And I go there to apologize, to make amends. And when I went in, I couldn't find anybody to talk to. There was no pastor. There was nobody. And I went in the chapel and I realized who I was there for. I have forgiven people because I held resentments against them, even though they didn't, actually, they didn't actually do anything to me. And I had to do the same thing with God. And I forgave God. And I started this process of forgiving Him for everything I had blamed Him for. And one of the most profound experiences of my life took place. I felt like I was a wind blowing through my soul, that I weighed nothing, and all of those uh, fears and resentments and all of the anxiety that I carried around with me all the time just drifted off. I felt like I weighed nothing. And I thought at first that was some profound spiritual experience. But it is the way we are when we are in a good relationship with God because when I'm with God, I'm like a child whose father is there. Peter was talking about being in his father's arms. This was me for the very first time in my whole life, embracing my Father, my Heavenly Father, and feeling the safety and the care and the power of the arms of my Heavenly Father. And from that point until now, I have never doubted that there is a God and that He loves me. I've gotten way off track when I don't practice my spiritual maintenance, but I've never doubted that there was a God who loved me. And from there, this was the beginning of my spiritual awakening, and I started to see that I was a spiritual being. And I ended up uh, going, the guys that I hung out with went and did an annual house cleaning every year. The big book says our real purpose 
The group's purpose is to help people get sober, but our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us, not only here in AA, but every place, all every, everybody we encounter. So um, um, we feel like the guys that I got sober with felt like you couldn't do that if you did one inventory and did a pretty good job at it, that we do it every year. We do the daily maintenance, but it's just like cleaning a house. Now and then you have a spring house cleaning. So every year we would go. I went with them, and we went to a place called Gethsemane, which is a Trappist monastery. monastery. It's where Thomas Merton, one of the guys I read, lived. And so um, I was familiar with it. I'd been there before. I'd been there before drunk. And um, and so uh, I, I went on this thing, and there was a priest, and he got up and he said, you boys are always talking about he's a special service for us. He said, you boys are always talking about God's will. Do you know what God's will is? And I had no idea, and the people I was with apparently didn't have any idea. Nobody ventured to guess. He said, God's will is simple. It's to do the best you can right now with what you've got. If you are a father, be a good father. If you're a brother, be a good brother. If you're a son, be a good son. If you're a husband, be a good husband. If you have a job that you love and you're good at it, serve people honorably in that job and do it honestly and serve others. If you have a job that you absolutely hate, do that job honorably and serve others until God gives you something else. He said, God sees us, his children, the same way we see our children. If you men had two boys and both of them were seven years old and you gave each one of them a little red wagon and one of them took that red wagon around the neighborhood and spread joy to the other neighbors, but the other one took the red wagon and kicked it aside and said, I want a scooter. Who would you give more to? And I had always been the one who kicked whatever I had aside because I wanted something other than what I had. And it had never occurred to me that my purpose in receiving a gift was to figure out how I could use it for your benefit. My entire life had been to get things for me to make me happy. Now I'm finding out the way in which I can be happy is to take the gifts I've already been given, not some I'm going to get, but take what I've got right now today, sitting here in the chair, and this is true for everybody in here. You have exactly what you need right now today for you to be useful to somebody else. And here's the deal about being useful. Last year, Barbara and I were speaking in our own hometown, except we're about 30 miles away from Atlanta, at the Atlanta Roundup. And while we were there, somebody broke into our house and stole $30,000 worth of uh, computers and everything else. And because I hadn't worked much in a long time, that was very important to us, that financial stuff. It didn't rock our boat because our value to other people could be just as important if we were living in a one-room apartment with a hot plate. Our value is the ability for us to be accessible to other people and for us to try to love other people and use the experience, strength, and hope we have in all areas, whether it's in work or in AA. And that doesn't require me to have a big car or a new girlfriend, or, I don't have any girlfriends. This is a manner, manner of speaking. Um, but I hear, no, but sometimes you're in the program, the guy gets up and says, you know, I got a new car and I'm living in a new place and I got a new girlfriend. And how is that helping you to serve others? Because we come in here with one mind. And if I'm willing to let go of my old way of thinking, if I'm willing to let go of these things, if I'm willing to forgive God, if I'm willing to forgive others, my mind will be connected, like the cell phone, with a higher consciousness. And I will realize that I'm put here on this planet to serve others. We had, uh, I'll, I'm not going to go through them, but I want to mention one thing about the traditions. When I was 15 years sober, I was in a hotel room in Los Angeles trying to find a gun to put a bolt in my head. Because I was working the first step and the last step. Practicing these principles in all our affairs to me was getting everybody sober. I had no idea how to be married. Barbara and I were married three years, and I was ten years sober, and um, one of the guys I sponsored fired me because of the way I treated Barbara. I didn't know how to be a husband. I didn't know how to love anybody. I had to learn those things. And It turns out that in the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, it gives us all of the principles we need to get along with other people. The first tradition is based on unity. That means we come before me. If Barbara and I have something we need to do, we come before me. Why would I be willing to do that? Because I would have to trust some power greater than me, and that comes in the second tradition, the only authority in, in our uh, uh, group, whether it's a family or anything else, is a kind of loving God as he may express himself through that group. I mean, if I trust God, then we have a relationship. 
which is, I believe is the only reason that and good sponsorship is the only reason we're still married after 27 years because I'm still not what I consider to be the easiest person to get along with because I'm a writer and I'm moody and, I'm, and, and Barbara and I have a good relationship. We love each other. Now, you, after having this experience, after being told what God expects of me and all these wonderful things, we start going out. And, and uh, when I hit that second bottom, when I was 15 years sober, I started over and I learned the traditions and I learned how to deal with other people. And that was really the starting of the fullness of, of, of AA for me was when I, when I started practicing the traditions as well as the steps. And then I, suddenly I'm involved in all kinds of service work and suddenly I'm a delegate and suddenly I'm, uh, we're traveling all over the place. We get to speak a lot of places. And... I wasn't seeking that. I like to be behind the scenes. I wasn't seeking that. And I like writing, and I like seeing other actors deliver my words, but I don't like speaking as much. And and what Barbara and I ended up doing is we had, this was kind of a new, it was something we could do. We could be useful. We could care for others. We could, sponsorships, the same thing, all of those things. And our life becomes full, and we have these great days. We're over, we were speaking at the All Scottish Convention in 1987, and we got to go to Killarney, and we're in Ireland, and we have this day where we walk at, at Ireland. There's a place called the Muckross House, and there's a beautiful field there. We walked up uh, a, a path of four-leaf clovers to where there was a waterfall, and um, Barbara and I are absolutely overcome, and we're sitting there crying with gratitude, and people would come by and say, are you okay? And Barbara and I say, yes, yeah, God's so good. And so, um, and... Uh, <laughs> You know, and uh, uh, they thought we were having mental, mental and emotional breakdowns at the top of the four-leaf clover path, and uh, you know, Yankees in Ireland. So, um, um, but but we thought that. But doing the best you can one day at a time does not always mean dealing with extreme joy. In 2005, Barbara and I weren't able to have children, and. Uh, we had an elk hound that went to lots of meetings with us called Booger Bear, and he was our child, and and uh, we had to put him to sleep at the age of 18. They normally lived to be 12, but we loved him to death and just carried him. We probably should have put him to sleep before that, but we had a weekend where we went off on an A thing and came back, and he couldn't stand up, and we had to put him to sleep. But we cried and held him in our arms, buried him, and thought we would never, ever grieve like that ever again. You know, because dogs don't argue with you. And uh, so, uh, but we just, both of us love this dog, and, and so we're, we're crying. Within a very short time period, this was 2005, Barbara's mom and dad, for whom we were caretakers, and, and they both had dementia, and one had Alzheimer's, and um, we loved them, and we were there with them all the time, and we thought we'd, they'd be around for some time. They died unexpectedly, both of them with heart attacks, within a week of each other. And, you know, couples do that sometimes when they love each other. One of them goes, and the other one goes shortly thereafter. And my mom died two months later. And in the middle of that, we go to the International in Toronto. It's 2005. And uh, uh, I come back from that, and I go to the doctor for a uh, physical and find out that I have esophageal cancer. And if any of you know about esophageal cancer, it's over 99% fatal. It's more fatal than pancreatic or liver cancer. And I couldn't tell Barbara that I had fatal cancer while she just lost both her mother and her father and our dog. And, uh, I mean, it's like a bad country western song, and so I'm not going to tell her that. So until I didn't want to say anything to her until I found a solution. And because I couldn't tell her, I couldn't tell you because you don't gossip. And so <laughs> my sponsor knew, my best friend Keith Lewis knew, another prayer part of mine, Ed Mutum knew, and my sister. And that's it. And we were looking for some place, and we found a center of excellence that was out at University of Southern California. And it was one doctor who had some success with this, where he takes two thirds of your stomach out and takes this, that stomach material and makes a stomach. Uh, they used to do a pull up, and it doesn't work all that well. But you take two thirds of your stomach out, form a new uh, esophagus out of the stomach material, remove everything out of the chest. I was on a uh, like a feeding tube for a year. Um, and this is a, it's like a whole upper digestive transplant and they build a new one and lots of times it doesn't work because they have to cut the vagal nerve which is the brains of the digestive system and so you actually starve to death your body won't accept any food very difficult process but they had found it and they had more success with it than anybody in the planet and he's out at the University of Southern California and I go out there and I get everything out there and I'm ready to go and and uh, uh, and I find out I'm supposed to speak that Saturday night in Key West at a, an event. And I'm going down there and I'm taking, when I can't take Barbara, she didn't go with me. I take one of my pigeons or a couple of pigeons and we're going in a car on the way down there. And I talked to them on the way down there and they said, um, we cannot take your insurance. 
Uh, but if you would like to put up uh, an equity of account of about $500,000, we can just do it on a cash basis. Well, if you know anything about most writers or creative people, there have been plenty of times you make lots of money, but the idea behind the money is then you take it all and spend it. We, that's the only plan we have, uh, financial plan I know of, is we get the money, we spend the money. So uh, I didn't have $500,000, and I'm going to speak at a conference to give people hope on Saturday night when I'm just told I'm going to die because I don't have insurance or they won't take my insurance. And I got, so I, I tried to pray, and I couldn't pray at all, at all. And I would start praying, and I just the anger would come out. And I was in that deep, dark hole. And if you've been in the sunlight of the Spirit and you go back to where you were before you came here, it's deeper, darker, and blacker than it's ever been before. And so I just couldn't even talk. And I didn't even want to be there. And a friend of mine who was there who knew what I was going through, because I shared it with him, he was speaking on Friday night, said, whenever I get like that, I, sh I say whatever prayer I can remember. It's not what you say. It's just trying to make contact. And I had memorized the 23rd Psalm for the PTA in the third grade. And so I started saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I kept on, and actually it was a pretty good prayer for what I was going through. Because I was going through the valley of the shadow of the death. And so, right before I went up Saturday night, I remember talking to my original sponsor, a railroad man named Jack Sullivan, and I had talked to him the day he walked out of a doctor's office and been told he had six malignant brain tumors and there wasn't anything they could do. And he's telling me this, and I'm finally sensing that he's telling me he's getting ready to go. And I said, Jack... You don't seem to be afraid. You don't seem to. And he said, if God has been this good to me here, just imagine what he's got waiting for me on the other side. The big book says we, one of the promises, we will lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. And it wouldn't say that if there were not a hereafter. And that's a lot bigger than 90 meetings in 90 days. And I got up, and what I accepted was, if God is going to take me to paradise, and that's the worst that's going to happen to me is I'm going to places better than here, I know he'll take care of Barbara, and we're both in good hands. And I got up and I spoke, and I said, I don't know whether I'm going to be here in two months or not. But I sure am grateful I'm here tonight, and I'm grateful for wherever God's going to take me. And came back on Monday, and I got a phone call, and it was from USC. And I'm, I'm the guy. I like the sun shining through the clouds and all that kind of stuff and all the movies. I'm a Frank Capra fan, and, I, and, um, uh, and I thought it was going to be them telling me they could take me because I prayed. And um, <laughs> see, actually, even though I'm praying, it's actually God who makes the decisions about this stuff. I have been asking God to help me with my will. I wanted to go out there because... Um, uh, because the people we knew out there, and I didn't know any, and just, I, this was my plan. Instead, they called and said, our chief of surgery just left here and just took a, a position as chief of surgery of a hospital in Rochester, New York, called Strong Memorial. Call him. So I called him. He called me back in an hour, had looked at all the labs. They'd sent it to him. And he said, we don't care about the insurance, but I want to teach this procedure to some people. Come on up. So now I've got to tell, um, I had not told Barbara, I, I just think sometimes it's better to tell, if you got a solution before you tell somebody about the problem. That's just the way I work, you know. By the way, I wrecked your car, but I got a way to fix it. So, um, I mean, it makes sense to me anyway. So, so I told Barbara, I do have cancer, because she was saying, you're going to have an operation and have some tissue taken out? Yeah, quite a bit. And so um, 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 so we, we get in the car and we head on up there. Now, we're going to Rochester, New York. My dad's a general for Robert E. Lee. Uh, Barbara grew up in Atlanta. If you're going to make your exit, uh, nothing personal, but you just don't want to go to Yankee land if, if to, to make your exit. So, uh, uh, so we're, we're getting ready to, we're getting ready, I'm not talking about the baseball team, I love Mick. So, um, so anyway, but, so we don't know anybody in Rochester, New York. We get up there and, um, somebody had made some phone calls for us and from the time we got into the hotel where we stayed for a couple of days before I checked in the hospital, we had a new home group, we had a new Al-Anon group. They were there 24 hours a day, they did Barbara's, uh, a laundry. They took her out and got her out of the room from me. They were there nonstop. We went to meetings that night. We went to dinner with them. The next day I went to the hospital. We walk into the hospital and the first place we go is to the chapel. And in the chapel uh, there is this big wall that's 30 feet high with letters that are foot and a half deep in gold. It says, 
The Lord is my shepherd. And then we walked out into the lobby to see where God had brought us. And it was Strong Memorial Hospital, endowed by the family of Dr. Leonard Strong, who was Bill Wilson's brother-in-law. My experience is this. God has all power. He loves each one of us as his children. And all I have to do is ask God what he wants me to do right now today and take what he gives me and open the gift and use it for other people. And if I do that, the lame will walk, the blind shall see, and even drunks will live with purpose and dignity. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.